if you would, and turn to the book of Psalms and go to Psalm 4. <clears throat> when you come into Psalm 4, and of course the couple of weeks ago we dealt with Psalm 3, and the title at the beginning of Psalm 3 is a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. And so we know the context of, of the third psalm is that very context when David writes this psalm and he's hiding from his son and, of course, there's a rebellion. Uh, several people, and I can see where they get this, and it may well be the case, Psalm 4 seems to be in the same context, uh, but, of course, a separate psalm. And with all the parallels, that may be the case. So it's sort of helpful to understand, in a sense, probably at least nearby the same time, Still, this instance is fresh in the mind of David. He's still, maybe he's back now, and he's writing this as a reflection. Now, the title in this psalm, uh, to the chief musician on Neganoth, which means upon instruments. That's, this was written, and he says this was to be written with stringed instruments. And so it gives you the impression that maybe David looked back, was reflecting on the, uh, the same context of Psalm 3, maybe even after he was back in Jerusalem. He looked back and said, here's what God did and wanted to praise him for it. But you go into uh, this psalm and you'll notice, first of all, it starts off, it says, hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Of course, in the previous psalm, he's calling upon God. He is in the midst of the trial and he's calling. But now he says, hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness. Now, the first thing I notice about this psalm, and this certainly sets the tone for it, is he talks about his source. That is, who is he going to go to? Now, that seems to go without saying. It, it seems that if you're going to pray, well, who else would you pray to but God? But, you know, the fact is, uh, people often have gods that they may not get on their knees and worship like, a, like an idol, but anything that you depend on, in a sense, when you look to it to help you, becomes your God. You know, some people get their security from money. And money becomes their God. Uh, security is in God, not the money. Now, God may well provide through different means and so forth, gives us jobs, expects us to work. Uh, somebody else maybe depends on a person. Well, God may use a person to help take care of you, but ultimately, we are dependent on Him. Amen. And He says that the source here, He prays, He says, O oh God of my righteousness, Thou hast enlarged me. Now, David was in the situation that he was in when he was uh, running from Absalom. Why did that take place? You know, really it all started back when David fell into sin himself. And, and God said, the sword shall never depart from your house. And, one of the, and that wasn't a judgment necessarily from God. He was just saying, what, what you've sown, you're going to reap. His sons grew up knowing what David did, the lie that he told, and you know, he got right with God. But that little year that he spent away from God cost him a lot of years. And when his sons grew up seeing what they saw in David, now he was a man after God's own heart. He personally walked with God, was restored to fellowship, but that year of being out of fellowship with God definitely had its consequences. And of course, Absalom was raised during that time, and also David had gone out and uh, to another place and made a raid on a place. It's probably where he met Absalom's mother. And here he has Absalom who comes and kills uh, another brother because he had raped his sister. I mean, it was just a sordid tale as a result of David's sin. And now David is in a, uh, a state where Absalom has taken over the kingdom. And you know what, David, he could have looked at that and he could have sat back and said, well, there's no need to pray because I, I deserve this. There's no need to ask God to help me because I'm just reaping for what I'm sown. But you know, if I couldn't ask God to help me in the midst of trouble because I put myself there from reaping from my stupidity, I wouldn't hardly ever have to call upon him. Most of the time when I'm in trouble, if I were to look at it, I'd say, you know, I'm probably the biggest problem here. Every once in a while, some things happen that maybe we think, well, I'm just a victim of circumstance. How much more? Can I call upon God when I'm simply the victim of circumstance? But David, I'm encouraged here, says, I'm going to turn to God and ask him to help me because what is he the God of? He is the God of my righteousness. Now, I don't have any righteousness 
apart from God. Right. Now, David, uh, you know, in the man's mind who thinks that he's uh, justified by works, if I were counting on my works to please God, I'd never call on him. Amen. Because I'd have to look and say, well, God, I, today hadn't been the greatest day. Day was okay, but boy, if I think about yesterday, probably not much need me to ask you. But when the provider of my righteousness is the one that I'm calling on, you see, here is the basis of all prayer. The basis of all prayer is that I'm calling upon God, not on my own works, but based on the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible means when it says, let us therefore become boldly before the throne of grace. You know what bold means? No hesitation. Fearlessly. You know, it doesn't really in the human mind when a you know, if you have any concept of I'm just coming because I deserve it, you couldn't come boldly. I'd have to come with God very apprehensively. You know, Old Testament saints prayed somewhat like that because they didn't understand the New Testament truth. Now, they had a standing they didn't recognize. But think about Abraham. He came to God and he said, God, if there be 50 righteous in Sodom, would you not save the place for 50 righteous? And, of course, God said, I'll spare it for 50. Then he prayed for 45, and then 40. You notice how he comes, and he says, Oh, let not the Lord be angry. Peradventure, I'd ask just this one more time. God, I'm just dust and ashes. Let me approach you. Now, I'm not saying it's not good to recognize your dust and ashes, but we don't have to approach God wondering if he might be maybe a little offended by the request. We come in Jesus' name. I mean, we have the New Testament to explain to us because the, I mean, Abraham, yes, looked forward to the cross. We've experienced the cross, the resurrection. We look back at Calvary and see the work is completed. You know, some people have put it this way, that when an Old Testament saint was saved, he was saved on credit. I mean, he, the debt hadn't actually been paid yet, so it was like you're saved on credit. But the thing is, when God's credit uh, is perfect credit. So it was as good as done as far as God was concerned. When Jesus said, it is finished, he didn't say it like today. He said, it has been. It's completed. It's done. It's, it's over with. And we pray with that basis. So he says, God of my righteousness, with all my failures, with all my shortcomings, he asked to be enlarged. He said, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress. Have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. You know, I think about Jabez a well-known little section. You know, you're reading through the book of First Chronicles and you're reading name after name that you can't pronounce and all of a sudden you come to Jabez. All of these names are mentioned and here's this insignificant little character that he's not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible and God said, now Jabez was more honorable than his brethren and he prayed and he prayed a prayer, God enlarge my coast, keep me from evil, bless me indeed and it says God answered his prayer. Now, that's a remarkable thing. David said, God, you have enlarged me. Now, some of you take that out of context and say, well, I don't have any problem there, preacher. God's done that. All right. Well, he doesn't mean physically. Obviously, he's talking about opportunity. He's talking about when God enlarges you, he's doing things for you that you cannot do. I mean, he can broaden you in many ways. And again, I'm talking here spiritually, providentially. Uh, he can open doors for you that nobody can open. And God says, when I open them, nobody shuts them. Now, before I can even move any further, I have to recognize, David said, I'm going to the source. He's the God of my righteousness. Well, then I notice in contrast to that, verse 2, he talks about the sons. He said, oh, ye sons of men, how long... Will you turn my glory into shame? Now, I have to think that what he meant by that, David had been put in a position of being, the, of course, the king. And for this short time, he had been put, in, uh, you know, put out of the kingdom and Absalom had taken over. And all of the people that were his counselors and everybody in the court basically followed Absalom except his very faithful few. And so he's reflecting on this and he says, how long will you turn my glory into shame? Now, of course, there's probably a prophetic aspect to this as well. The Lord Jesus Christ, of course, we see uh, pictured all through the Old Testament. And, and, and man would have put him down, would have, in a sense, gave him that uh, shame of spitting and the shame of the cross and the, saint, the disdain of not listening to him. But, of course, we know that it was only going to be for a short time. 
But doesn't this characterize the world? David says, how long will you sons of men turn my glory into shame? How long will you love vanity and seek after leasing? Which leasing is lying or untruth. How long are you going to go after vanity and untruth? You know, the world does just that. And it's a good question to ask. How long do you think this is going to go on? Why would you go after vanity? Now, vanity is not merely, uh, you know, I look in the mirror and think, boy, I really look like something today. I mean, I know, you know, that, that's, I'm vain, right? That's vanity. That's not the whole idea, though it's related. It means emptiness. The world goes after emptiness. So essentially what, you know, the world looks at it as glittering and uh, exciting. Uh, I can't wait till the next party. Boy, if we can just go have us another party like we did, oh, a couple of months ago, man, we're going to booze it up and have a big time. And boy, isn't it great and it's wonderful. They are going after air. It's nothing. It's vanity. And it's not neutral, by the way. It's vanity that will destroy you. But why would the world get so excited about nothing? Or they live, and, and listen, I'm a, I'm a sports fan. I mean, I, I watch you know, sporting events and so forth, and I'm, I'm glad when one comes on and I can pull for my team. Um, even in spite of themselves, I'll keep pulling for them. But anyway, uh, the fact is... Uh, if somebody's whole life, if they live and think, oh, I just can't wait for the Super Bowl. And there's people that, man, I mean, for six months, that's their whole focus. I can't wait one night, couple of hours, it's over. You say, well, surely nobody's really that. There are people, I'm telling you, that they, they plan for it for weeks. That's their whole, they buy, spend all kinds of money on it. It's a, and that's just one event. Maybe it's the World Series. Maybe it's college football starting up. I mean, whatever it is, nothing wrong with sports. But the, can you imagine investing everything into vanity? But then it's not just something like that neutral thing. The world actually invests in evil things that will destroy your life and lies. Have you noticed that lies spread faster than the truth? I mean, why does the world get excited about hearing something untrue? You know, if somebody uh, comes in and, and into work and they uh, say, I hey, mean, something really exciting happened yesterday. So-and-so's little uh, son uh, won a contest and, and got a trophy or something. And Okay, well, that's nice to know. That's wonderful. That's good. And they go back to work. But if they came in, did you hear that so-and-so's... Uh, daughter got thrown out of school because she cheated. Man, everybody will gather in a circle around it. Tell us the details. We want to know more about that. Probably not even true, not even verified. And even if it is, it's not edifying. People will get more excited about a lie than they will about the truth. Amen. Now, he's asking the question, why do they do it? Well, you know, I don't know if you can answer why, except man is a depraved individual. Right. And all of us without Jesus, that's where we are. The Bible says when they knew God, Romans 1, they glorified him not as God, but became vain in their imaginations. What can man imagine? Vain things. He can just come up with vanity. So you could spend some time here explaining what man looks like, but I'd rather go back and think about the one he says who is the God of my righteousness. He contrasts the two. So we see the source and we see the sons. Now look at the separation in verse 3. But know, now this is, in, in again, a contrast. You've got God mentioned in verse 1. You've got these sons mentioned in verse 2, the world. But verse 3, know that the Lord hath set apart, that separation, him that is godly for himself. Now, the psalmist, of course, is viewing this, and, and this was in the context of the law, and you'll see many times in the Psalms, uh, the ideal is placed in the Scripture. That is, I don't know who could fit this except the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, Jesus is the only one that really, in his own merits, is godly. Because he is God. Right. But there's still a principle here that's obviously true. The more I am like him, the more I'm set apart from the world to him, the closer I become to him. Now, the foundation is laid through the Lord Jesus, but what is a godly person? 
I mean, you don't have to really get deep involved in the definition. It just means more like God. What does Jesus, when he moves inside of us, what is he doing? What is the Holy Ghost doing? We're being conformed. That means poured into his mold. We're being conformed to the image of Jesus. Now, God has set apart him that is godly for himself. Now, there's a practical side of that, and I understand the practical devotional side. But think about for a moment, who is set apart unto God? It is his church. Now, I'm not talking about a building. I'm not talking about just a group of folks that meet together and claim to be religious. I'm talking about born-again, blood-washed individuals that have become part of the body of Christ. You know what they are? They're godly. Amen. Not all are godly all the time, but we are in Christ. We have become godly. And let me tell you, the church is set apart from the sons of men who seek after leasing. Amen. They are set apart. Now, he says that uh, he has set apart him that is godly for himself, and the Lord will hear when I call unto him. Now, David obviously is implying that he's godly. Uh, David, again, is speaking here positionally. You know, David, this is a great mark of inspiration because David had been through uh, a rough time. David, of course, himself had seen some difficult things take place in his life. He had obviously failed the Lord in a great way. You read Psalm 51 after he sins, and uh, there's truth in Psalm 51 that David didn't learn anywhere except from the Holy Ghost. Uh, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He here again says, God will separate the godly. Well, is he godly? Only through the righteousness of Jesus. And he says, God will hear when I pray. You know, there is certainly a truth. On the one hand, I can't claim any merit on my own of why God would listen to me when I pray. The merit is in Jesus. Thank God it is. But I can blame myself when he doesn't hear me. Psalm 66, 18. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. You know, people have misunderstand that to think, well, if I'm not perfect, God doesn't hear me. If I fail, God doesn't hear me. If, if I don't live, you know, basically exactly what the Bible says, he doesn't hear me. But notice the Bible says there, if I regard it. You know what regard means? It really strictly means to see something. I know it's there. It's there, and I won't pay any attention to it. You know, my problem is not that when I fail, God's a forgiving God. In fact, I'm sure that today I could feel pretty good about myself. I mean, I could say, well, I feel like I've had a good devotional time today. I've had a good prayer time today. Maybe I even got a chance to witness to someone today. In fact, I don't know of any uh, direct sin. I'm saying this theoretically. I don't have too many days like that. But I mean, let's just say I, I feel pretty good. Boy, I had a good day and I think I've done all right. And so probably today I'm godly and I don't regard iniquity in my heart. Do you think on, on my best day, if Jesus came down and you compared me to him, I would realize I'm not probably as good as I thought I was. I'm probably not nearly at the height I thought I had achieved. So therefore, would God still hear my prayer? Well, he would. Because again, when it comes to regarding iniquity in your heart, it's talking about living in the light. That is walking in the light as he is in the light. I'm going to tell you, none of us are where we ought to be spiritually. In fact, if you think you are, then you definitely aren't where you ought to be spiritually. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Hey, the poor in spirit, that means I recognize I've got a long way to go spiritually. And that's where we ought to be. So David can pray this prayer with confidence. God will hear my prayer because evidently whatever had taken place, he had dealt with it. He's going to deal with that a little bit more in detail. If you move forward, he says now not only is he separated, but look at the standing in all. He says in verse 4, stand in all and sin not. Now, you know, Paul uh, probably is quoting this passage in Ephesians 4 when he says, be ye angry and sin not. Uh, it's a pretty close parallel, but one part of the Bible typically will interpret another part for you. Both of these shed light on each other. You know, when you think of anger, you think of intense energy poured into something. I mean, it's one thing to be bothered by something. But what does the word anger communicate to you? Angry 
There's intensity involved. You're stirred. Now, at the same time, when I think of all, when I think of all, of course, today we've misused the word awesome. You know, uh, people say anything is awesome. That car is awesome. That uh, ham- uh, hamburger I just had was awesome. You know, but really, only God is awesome. It means causes all. To, to simply as a human being to look at God. So Paul quotes this passage and he says, Be ye angry and sin not. The point in the New Testament is, I can be angry, but why? Because I'm angered that God's glory has been affected. There's only one reason to get angry. It's because God has been offended. That's why you get angry. If you personally get angry because you've been offended, he goes on to say in the exact same passage, Ephesians 4, Be not bitter against them. Uh, uh, Forgive as Christ has forgiven you. Uh, Let all anger, bitterness, wrath be put away from you with all malice. The whole point is, there's only one good reason to get angry. It's for God's glory. So how do I stand in awe of God? What I do is I stand in awe and I think to myself, God is so holy that all sin is a great offense to Him. I stand in awe and I sin not. Exodus 15, 11. I think where it says there, and, and Moses thinking about God, he says, Who is like thee, O God, um, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee? Glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders. I mean, who is like him? Here is a great passage about holiness in the life of a believer to stop and think, Why would I sin when I think about what sin is like in the presence of God? He's going to deal with that in the next psalm, by the way, and we'll, we'll pick that up when we get to that, Lord willing. But he says, stand in all and sin not. Now notice he says, commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still. Why would he tell me to commune with my own heart? I mean, you think I'd want to commune with God, right? I want to commune with him. I don't want to commune with myself. Well, it's all tied together. Stand in all. Don't sin. Because when you, if you commune with your own heart, you'll recognize you're the problem. You know what confession is? Confession is when you agree with God, you're the problem. Right. See, that's what the word confess means. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, it means to say the same, to agree with. Basically, here, here, is, here is me on this side, and there's sin in my life. Now, I look at, it, what I do is I back away, and I say, boy, that, that act that's associated with me, is wrong. God, you and I are on the same side. That guy over there, Frank Bailey, he's the problem. Nobody else. You know, our, your tendency and mine is to say, well, yeah, it wasn't right, but you don't know how I got raised. It wasn't right, but you don't know what this person did to me. Sure, I might have lost my temper and hit the guy in the nose, but here's why, because, you know, he treated me such and such. Well, now, I can come up with any reason to justify my sin. And you know what? If you were to, it might be the other guy's wrong, but he's not the reason I'm not right with God. Hey, I'm glad I don't have to be dependent on anybody else to be right with God. All I got to do is get on God's side against Frank Bailey's sin, and then I have a promise. If I confess my sin, not most of the time, or, you know, it may be the first five times, but if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me for my sin and to cleanse me from all unrighteousness. You know, I, I, I'm glad that when Peter said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? Oh, no. Seventy times seven. Basically, no limit. If he told Peter to forgive his brother limitless times, well, I have to believe God would do that for me too, right? right. I have to believe he's willing to forgive me the same way. Now, he says, commune with your own heart. You know what it is? It's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Commune with your own heart upon your own bed, and you stand in all, and that's how you get victory over sin. Well, he says as well, in verse 5, he talks about a sacrifice. He says, offer the sacrifices of righteousness and put your trust in the Lord. Now, you remember when Paul, I mean, rather Saul, uh, the king, not the uh, persecutor of Christians, but King Saul was told by God, to go destroy the Amalekites. He said, I want you to destroy the people. I want you to destroy 
the houses. I want you to destroy the cattle. I want you to burn up their possessions. I, I don't want nothing left from the Amalekites. Wipe them out completely. So Paul, or Saul rather, went in, wiped out the Amalekites, killed all the people, killed the babies, killed the kids, killed everybody. It sounds like he's on the right track. He's going along and saves valuable possessions, saves the sheep, saves some of the other things, saves the king. Now, when you save the king, that's first of all, look at what I did. I'm going to show you King Agag. That's what the kings did back in the day. That's how the world operated. They saved the king, brought him through town, a live king. Here he is, put their foot on his neck, and when it's all said and done, they'd sometimes kill them or sometimes they'd cut off their thumbs and their big toes so they'd make them eat at their table, you know, with their hand to humiliate them and so forth. That's all about pride. He kept King Agag. Then he also kept the sheep because, after all, we've got to keep the sheep. So the testimony to the world that day was simply God is like everybody else. He just wanted to go wipe out a nation so he could have the advantage of wiping out a nation. God had a different message. God's message was these people had defied me, and this is the judgment of God. And, you know, I'm not reading into the passage, but I think you definitely see there God was saying you destroy even the valuable stuff, and the message will be this was the judgment of God. Now, Saul took it in his own hands, but now... As bad as that was, as awful as that was to do that, he had a good reason. He said, well, you know what I did? I saved those sheep to do sacrifices. Isn't that religious? I mean, God said we're supposed to have sacrifices. I mean, you've got to have a bunch of sheep to do it. Well, first of all, how is it a sacrifice when those sheep weren't yours to begin with? You're not giving up anything. Those are extras. So he reminded him in chapter 15 of 1 Samuel, Samuel said, Saul, you are greatly err. He said, don't you know that God is far more interested in obedience? He says, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now, I mean, God gave sacrifices. They all pointed to Jesus anyway. He said, but obedience is much more. Now think about this in verse 5, offer the sacrifices of righteousness now, they're still living in the context of the law. It's interesting, David didn't say here, offer God your best ram, offer God your best sheep. He said, offer the sacrifice of righteousness. Well, what is that? Obedience. And then, of course, he says, put your trust in the Lord. Well, now, somebody ought to write a hymn and call it Trust and Obey, for there's no other way but to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey, because one goes hand in hand, with the other one. Right. Now, if you want to stand in all, uh, he, here he lays out, you know, God, the world, the believer. Here's victory for the believer. And then the victorious Christian life leads to what? What's next, God? These hands are yours. These eyes are yours. That's what sacrifice is. See, I'm sacrificing myself. And that's what obedience is. God, this is yours first. These hands, this thought, these eyes, everything, they're yours first, and I'm giving them to you. You know what you have to do when you do that? you got to trust. God, I believe you'll use them better than I can use them. And that's what David is saying. So he tells them about the sacrifice, but then notice now the stability. You go down to verse um, 6, and he says, There be many that say, Who will show us any good? Lord, lift thou up the light of thy countenance upon us. What does it mean for God to smile on your life? That's, that's where that really, that analogy, and this is mentioned a number of times in several places in the Bible, but the idea that God would smile on you, lift up the light of thy countenance upon us. Smile on us, and here's what happens. Thou hast put gladness in my heart, more than in the time that their corn and wine increased. Whose corn and wine? Well, the world's. Now, he's not talking about corn liquor here, but, I mean, the same idea. He's talking about what the world, he's not even talking about in a sinful context. This is provisions. Uh, corn and wine was provision. And he's saying, what could the world offer me physically that is in comparison with the gladness that God puts in my heart? Amen. You know, I'm glad to be a Christian today. And, and, you know, glad isn't just something I worked up. God put the joy of the Lord in my heart. Now, I may emotionally get knocked off kilter sometimes. That can happen. We can maybe not have the best day, not feel that good, 
but the joy of the Lord is your strength. And even though you can become weak physically, you can still look to God. God will put gladness in your heart. I mean, that is stability. What, what could the world give that would compare with the joy of the Lord? What would a person pay to be, in their definition, happy? Just how much money would a person be willing to give? If a guy was a multi-billionaire and the doctor said, look, I can give you a set of vitamins. It's not a drug. It's not a narcotic. I will give you some vitamins that will so affect your dopamine and your serotonin level that you will live in euphoria every day. You'll be perfectly coherent. It's not like a narcotic, but you will never be able to be down, depressed. I mean, everything to me, you will take it in stride and you just, everything will look positive to you. How much would that pill be worth? I mean, a guy'd say, well, yeah, I got 10 B, and I'd certainly give you a couple for the rest of my life to live like that. Well, I'm not going to say you can't compare the joy of the Lord with some human element, but God's got something far better than that. Amen. And it doesn't just last for this life. It's for all eternity. Amen. It's gladness. Now, happiness has to do with happenings. You can have some bad happenings. I don't doubt for a moment Miss Hill tonight is not happy, okay? But she can still have the joy of the Lord. Now, he says he gives us gladness. He says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Do you think the world has these two things, peace and sleep? They like both. Now, you can have physical problems and not be able to sleep. Everybody's suffered that to some extent. But what keeps people up at night other than a physical need? Worry. David was being chased by Absalom. And I think, again, this was written afterwards. How was David able to go to sleep? Um, look down in verse 5 of chapter 3, Psalm 3. I laid me down and slept. I awake for the Lord sustained me. Hey, I got a guy taking over my kingdom who's right now coming up with a way to kill me. But you know what? I've put it in God's hand. I'm going to sleep. And you know, that's exactly what I've done with the state of our country by God's grace. I'm going to put it in God's hand and I'm going to sleep because he's in control. And I'm going to leave it in his hand. Trust, pray, ask God to work. God, I've got an idea. I sure would like to see it move this way. But you know what? You know better than I do. And I'm going to leave it in your hand. And you can lay down and sleep. And God will sustain you. God can give peace and joy when the world gives turmoil. You know, it's not just rhetoric. That's not just because it's a state of mind. It's, it's a gift from God by His Spirit living inside of you. And you can't have it if you don't have Jesus. There is no peace, saith my God. To the wicked. So David recognized he was stable. God gave him gladness, gave him peace, and gave him sleep because he could trust God. Amen. Now, here David had gone through a very difficult time. And again, I remind you, basically brought it on himself. But even though he brought it on himself, God graciously sustained him in the midst of it. And that's what he can do for us as well. Let's have a word of prayer tonight.